and uh, no regular rain, rainfall there, droughts and all these problems relating to the health of the people has been seen and we have seen floods that is damaging many of the villages, the natural calamities has been seen and the impact in the mountainous region is, is much more in the downstream where 1.3 billion of the population live in India, in Bangladesh. So the problem of Nepal is not only the problem of Nepal's people, rather the problem of at least 1.3 billion of population. That's a Nepali Prime Minister, Nepal. Uh, that is his name. Your response to that, Dr. Jim Hansen? Well, yeah, we see the climate changes. The, it's at the top of the mountains, the glaciers all around the world are, are melting and those glaciers are actually very important because they provide fresh water for the major rivers of the world. Um, during the dry season, the rivers such as the Brahmaputra, the Ganges rivers, more than half the water in the river is from melting glaciers. So once those glaciers are gone, it's a real problem. But the problems are also occurring at the other end of uh, the rivers, the, um, the, the coastline of of uh, Bangladesh, for example, is going to be moving inward and you're going to have um, hundreds of millions of people who will be refugees. So it's, it's especially these poor nations around the world that will suffer from uh, climate change. Last week, I also caught up with the president of the Maldives, Mohamed Nasheed. Uh, now, this is a low-lying island, the Maldives at the front line of climate change. And I asked him what a three degrees Celsius rise in temperature, because the IFCCC, the Climate Change Conference, apparently there was this document um, that we exposed on Democracy Now! with the French news organization Mediapart, saying that their plans, what they were putting forward, wouldn't actually increase um, the temperature by two degrees Celsius, but actually by three degrees. And I asked the Maldivian president, uh, Mohammed Nasheed, to describe what that would mean for his country. That would mean that we won't be around. That would mean the death of us. And, and that's really not acceptable for us. We cannot survive with that kind of um, temperature rise. For people who don't understand climate change, which is probably most people in the United States, why wouldn't you be around? What would happen? Uh, sea levels would rise. We are just 1.5 meters above the water. And if we have uh, sea levels rising um, to uh, 70, 80 centimeters, that's going to eat up most of our country. Um, so we won't be around. Are you making preparations for a mass population removal to uh, dry land? Well, you know, we've been there in the middle of the Indian Ocean for the last 10,000 years, and we have a written history that goes back 2,000 years. I can move, but where would all the butterflies go, all the sounds go, all the culture go, all the color go? Um, I don't think it really is a feasible option to move. It's going to be almost impossible for us to convince our people to move. That is the Maldivian president, yeah. Mohammed Nasheed. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. Uh, and that's what was happening in Copenhagen. The wealthy countries are trying to basically buy off these countries that will, in effect, disappear. It doesn't make sense. I mean, and the danger is that these countries will see this money. That's why the United States offered uh, to to uh, promote a hundred billion dollars per year, which is which is uh, imaginary money because I don't think that's going to happen. The United States share of that, based on our contribution to the carbon in the atmosphere, would be 27 percent, 27 billion per year. Do you think that our Congress is going to vote 27 billion? per year to give these poor countries it's not going to happen what we and it's but that's the danger that these poor countries will say gee that's a lot of money maybe we can get that what we actually have to do is solve the problem not pay people off and that requires uh, reducing the carbon emissions let me ask you about the East Anglia controversy, the University of East Anglia, that the um, climate deniers, the climate change deniers are using. Um, explain what happened, actually, the discussion between the scientists, what is being called climate gate, in emails that hackers got a hold of, and how it's being used. 
Yeah, well, obviously this discussion between some of the client climate scientists revealed frustrations that they have with the contrarians who continually will nitpick about is this station data good or is that one not. And what they should have done is release their full data immediately because the, there's no question about uh, the actual climate change. And um, by by having, by this attempts to not be completely open, they open themselves up to criticism. But in fact, the climate uh, record is, is uh, not debated, and it's not debatable if, if they give all the data, then they give the opportunity to somebody else to show, oh, it's really not warming. But of course, they can't show that, because the evidence is all over the place that the climate really is changing. So, but unfortunately, this episode has been very confusing to the public. So now there are many in the United States, especially, who are skeptical about whether the climate change is real. So it's been a public relations disaster, but it doesn't change the science one iota. In fact, uh, the science has become clearer and clearer over the last several years. Mm. Um, can you talk about where the United States is versus Europe? I talked to people throughout Europe and Copenhagen. I mean, thousands of people came out. Whether you wanted those talks to collapse or not, the level of networking and of groups all over the world was truly remarkable that took place there, largely outside yeah. of the yeah. Bella Center, but also inside, because uh, in the last few days, civil society was really kept out of those talks. Um, but they said the United States is years behind in just the discourse, because we're at yeah. the point of if you even have a discussion in the U.S. media, it's about whether global warming exists. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, it's about the debates are about, well, what do we do? I yeah. mean, carbon sequestration, should there be cap and trade? What are the alternatives? That's where the debates lie there. Here, we're way behind. Yeah. And for a very good reason, uh, because of the effectiveness of the industries that don't want to see change. They have had an enormous impact on the public's perception of the issue. Where do you see that with scientists, for example? We just did that piece on health care, the amount of money they're pouring in lobbying on health care. What is it in um, on global warming legislation that didn't pass the Senate, $300,000 a day from coal, oil, gas? Well, yeah, there are more than 2,500 uh, energy lobbyists in Washington. So that's more than four per congressperson. And that's... Um, Unfortunately, the public just doesn't have that kind of representation. And they, it's also a, 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 a fact that the industry influences the, um, the media, so that you always see this presented as if it's an either uh, there's one side and there's another side, as if they were equal. But in fact, the science has become crystal clear. And we have the most authoritative scientific body in the world in the National Academy of Sciences. So all the president would need to do if he wants to make this issue clear to the public is ask.